Uh, Glafke Skat Rawan in uh, the attendee list is, I think, also a another one of our speakers. If you can bring them into the panelist mode, that's great. Okay, welcome everyone to day six of the Towards a Lunar Generation workshop. And today we have uh, Kat Coder and Scott Rowan with us from Lockheed Martin. And they're going to talk about uh, some of the technologies that will be used for uh, potentially a future moon village. So Kat, Scott, the floor is yours. Okay, um, good morning, everybody. Uh, Kat Coder with Lockheed Martin. Uh, here in Denver, Colorado. I am the uh, deputy manager for our uh, deep space exploration advanced programs. Um, so do a lot of the early uh, technology development and, and, uh, and architecture work. I am a system architect uh, over here at Lockheed Martin. Um, and Scott's kind of here to help me out a little and, and some questions. And Scott, I guess if you wanna just kind of say hi too. Sure. Thanks, Kat. Uh, my name is Scott Round. I work with Kat um, on a daily basis. She's over on the deep space exploration side, and I'm on the human exploration side. We're both managers for uh, advanced technologies. We work for a group called um, Advanced Programs for Commercial Civil Space, and um, very excited to support Kat in this effort. And so uh, what I'm going to do today, as far as, as some talking points here, um, the I'm going to basically start and give you a little bit of a, a background on commercial civil space, um, some of our uh, our spacecraft um, that we have currently in operation, uh, a little bit of our history uh, on the deep space technologies front, um, and then I'm going to walk you through uh, some of the the history that of some previous missions and some of the data that we've gotten from the moon, some of the things that we've learned there, uh, and then kind of talk through some of the the future um, technologies, um, you know, potentially. Uh, what you know the moon could look like, and um, and then some of those those critical pieces that we need to really get there and have a a sustainable architecture on the moon, and and really get us towards that whole moon village uh, concept. So, um, so just going to touch a little bit on on Lockheed Martin Space, uh, our commercial civil space division. Uh, this is where both Scott and I uh, uh, work out of. Uh, so really, that covers really five core uh, areas, uh, so communication systems, uh, weather and earth science, human space exploration, uh, what we call our lunar exploration campaign, uh, and deep space exploration. Uh, so really covering that, that civil market, predominant customers are, are NASA and NOAA. Um, so I'm actually, I reside in that deep space exploration area. Really the whole point of, of that area there is, you know, unlocking the secrets of the solar system uh, for uh, planetary defense, Earth origins. Um, and then um, I've also been in both the human space exploration and the lunar exploration campaigns area, um, which, you know, really are looking to develop that infrastructure, get the humans to the moon, humans to Mars, um, and really uh, ensuring that we have uh, the, the development and the technologies that we need uh, for, a, for lunar exploration. Uh, I want to touch Based on, uh, from a Lockheed Martin perspective, <clears throat> the uh, spacecraft that we have recently in operation. So a, a lot of people don't realize that we actually have a, our own, um, we call it our MSA, our mission support area here in Denver. Um, and this is where we actually, we operate spacecraft out of. Um, so these are some of the uh, recent operations that we've had um, for various spacecraft. Um, and you know, mission control and, and mission control operations, getting data there and back, commanding spacecraft are all real critical technologies that we do need in order to um, enable exploration. And I'll talk a little bit more about kind of what some of those, those technologies and those gaps are and the things that we're trying to do to make sure we close those gaps. Um, I, I call this the swish chart. Um, it's basically, if you read from the bottom right um, and then kind of come around the curve, um, up through from Viking all the way up through Dragonfly. 
uh, what this shows is, uh, is really Lockheed Martin's history of, of uh, building, designing, testing, operating uh, planetary spacecraft and uh, lunar spacecraft in there. So you'll see um, really we've been involved uh, for quite, a, quite some time, um, all the way from the Viking missions in the 70s. Um, and then, you know, we've, we've also most recently in terms of operations, uh, you know, InSight is on the surface of Mars right now. Uh, the Lucy spacecraft, um, which will be exploring uh, asteroids. Uh, that one is actually in our current, it's in the final stages of, of integration and test, uh, about to be shipped um, out to the launch site for an October launch. Um, and then as far as, you know, some future lunar exploration, we do have a, a, a Luna IR 6U CubeSat. Uh, that's actually going to be uh, co-hosted uh, on the uh, Artemis 1 mission. Um, and then from a lunar perspective, we're also working on Lunar Trailblazer is in development uh, from a, a past lunar missions. We've been involved in GRAIL um, as well as a Lunar Prospector. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of those past missions as well. So let's talk a little bit about some of the data and, and some of the things that we've, some spacecraft that we have uh, gained a good understanding of the moon. And then um, we can kind of talk a little bit from there about where we should be going and uh, with some of this knowledge. Um, so really these, these lunar missions, we've got a lot of, of great data on the surface, the environment, um, and really all these upcoming missions that we've got going on from a, uh, a NASA perspective really are um, going to add that, um, add to that data. And not only NASA, I mean, there's, you know, we've got a lot of different plans, you know, across the globe from, um, you know, an actual learning and, and sending, sending missions to the moon and really gaining a better understanding. Um, and, and a lot of, uh, you know, missions like Lunar Prospector and, and GRAIL, um, you know, we're, we we're able to learn a lot from there for that I think could really lend it to an in situ um, resource utilization. So that whole ISRU piece, which really is going to be a key technology if we're going to have any real um, lunar economy or sustained presence on the moon. Um, it, it just makes sense to use what you've got there. Um, and, and, you know, uh, robotic missions such as these um, really helped us to, uh, to really learn what's going on from a lunar prospector perspective. You know, we, we've got information on, on polar ice deposits, uh, magnetic and gravity fields. Uh, we studied lunar outgassing uh, events. Um, and we had a, um, uh, they did actually detect hydrogen at both um, lunar poles. So we got some real critical data for some ISRU um, for future exploration. GRAIL was really all about mapping gravity fields. Um, so to really determine what the interior structure was of the moon or is of the moon. Um, and, and really GRAIL, you know, the, one of the reasons we also like to understand and, <clears throat> and study the moon is, is because we're really looking at that, what, is, what was the origin um, of, of really the planets and, and Earth especially. Um, and so the moon has some of that information still there um, because it wasn't really destroyed by the, the, the geological processes that have occurred on Earth. Um, and, you know, the other thing is, you know, if you're looking at a, a sustaining presence on the moon, a very interesting feature there um, is, you know, those lava tubes. Um, I know we've, there's been studies and we've been looking at, hey, you know, can you actually put a human uh, habitat in the lava tube, provide you um, some shelter from that cosmic radiation, um, MMOD, and, and just the, you know, some of the environments in general um, on the surface. Lunar reconnaissance orbiter. So let me, let me touch base on this one a little bit. This was really um, I think has shown us a lot more about the moon um, and really delivered probably more data than uh, I think any other lunar mission. Um, and a lot of this data is actually available online. There's, there's a, a website you can actually bring up um, that NASA has that you can bring up and, uh, and actually go through and, and pull up LRO data and see uh, the exact mapping and, and get a lot of good information. Um, it's basically was a detailed mapping um, uh, of the moon. Uh, you know, what we're looking at that for and what we can use that data from. Um, so identifying landing sites, uh, identifying where the resources are, those water ice deposits. Um, also even, you know, categorizing the radiation environment, 
Um, but really that, that water ice deposits, we were able to show, see those at the lunar south pole. Um, and again, if we're gonna be able to actually uh, have a lunar economy, uh, the data from LRO is invaluable to that because we can really understand where those deposits are. And you know, from a, from a human exploration and, and a human uh, element on the moon there, uh, that's looking like some really good areas in order to do um, some initial landings and maybe set up uh, some sort of a, um, a, a base of operations down there. Um, just to touch a little on some of the other science locations, um, I am an engineer, not a lunar scientist. Um, my lunar scientist, uh, lunar scientists, we have two of them, um, uh, planetary scientists that are in our advanced programs group, uh, describe this chart a lot better than I do. So I'm not gonna um, butcher it terribly, uh, but really, you know, looking at a lot of the, the South Pole regions, the Aiken Basin, uh, Schrodinger Basin, um, there's, a, there's some lava tubes that we've been identified. Um, and all of these are of interest, not only from a human landing system, but from a, a robotic exploration system. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a moment about how, um, you know, it's gonna be a, a combination of, of human and, and different robotics probes and, and really, um, those different surface features and, and assets and technologies that really need to, um, that can really in, ensure that we have um, a sustained presence. So let me touch a little bit on, um, on this chart here. So this is really kind of Lockheed Martin's um, vision of, of different uh, technologies and spacecraft um, that you know, can enable uh, exploration, uh, science and, and scientific study um, of the lunar surface. Um, so let me start a little bit with, you know, the gateway, and I'll touch a little on some of these um, because I'm going to highlight a couple of these technologies for you. Um, so the gateway um, is is really NASA's vision for a um, a small, uh, basically an outpost. It's a small space station, uh, really in orbit, in what's called a near nearly rectilinear halo orbit. Um, so that uh, orbit is, you know, in order to support um, missions, you would come and launch crew would launch from the Orion spacecraft, um, dock with the gateway, and then transfer into some sort of a, a human lunar lander system. Um, and then they would come down to the surface of the moon. <clears throat> and then if you, um, and then of course, from there, they would come back to the gateway and, um, and actually uh, get back into Orion and, and head home for the reentry. Um, so I think what this, this chart also shows is that we're looking at um, a variety of different kind of orbital and and both surface uh, technologies. So, so let's talk a little through some of the, the maybe the different technologies you're seeing on this chart. Um, so you'll notice that um, there we've got an ISRU plant. Um, so I'll talk a little more about that um, in, in a moment. Um, but really looking at uh, prospecting. So you know doing mining, prospecting, bringing it to some sort of a a, a plant where you can um, you know refine and, and and use that, um, what you're, you know, maybe uh, transfer it and, and create it into water, um, hydrogen, oxygen, um, you know, mobility systems, um, not only from a human mobility perspective, of course, being able to, the, the further and more that you can actually explore the surface, the more valuable science that you can, you can get. Um, so looking at different mobility systems, uh, both pressurized and unpressurized. Um, and mobility from a robotic perspective as well. Um, so having uh, different rovers um, looking at different aspects of the surface, um, doing some precursor work, uh, doing some prospecting and, and mining for us, um, and, um, and really being able to um, you know, ensure that, again, we're doing the most exploration that we can, but also trying to sustain you know, the whole human presence on the moon as well. Um, the, the other thing is that, you know, surface power. Um, so, you know, nuclear, we'll touch on that in a, in a few minutes, but um, nuclear is looking like it's, um, it could be a real key critical technology to actually um, have a, a sustained good power presence on the moon, um, especially on, in certain areas of the moon where you have either maybe on the, on the, um, on the, the whole lunar night and surviving the lunar night. Um, also down at the South Pole, you have pretty low uh, sun angles there. So solar isn't always for certain times of the year, you have pretty, you can have a couple weeks of eclipse um, where you could actually, you know, not have a whole lot of power. So having a good strong power source is 
really important. Um, you'll see up there a cryogenic demonstration mission. So um, cryogenics um, and, and really working on that cryogenic technology, I think is extremely important as well. Um, and, um, you know, Lockheed Martin is, is working on a cryo demonstration mission um, that will be launching um, here in the next um, couple of years. Um, so that, that is just really just kicking off right now. All right, let me touch on a few of the things here. So I talked a little about the gateway. Um, so this really is a, a waypoint. This is a way that we can aggregate um, elements, landers, the, the people, um, even cargo. Um, the, the one great thing that actually the, the lunar economy and this whole lunar outpost here could actually um, also, um, you saw it in the previous picture, could also enable uh, even Mars exploration. Um, so using that as kind of a, a staging point to launch off humans to Mars. Um, so um, really looking at the gateway for things like telerobotics. So, um, you know, not even having humans on the surface, but you can operate um, different spacecraft uh, from, the, from the gateway onto the surface. Um, there's also, you know, having a little bit more sp space for science. Um, so being able to do science kind of in orbit and also on the surface of the moon. Let's talk about some landed systems. Um, so as far as, you know, sustaining humans and habitats. So we'll have, you know, in order to really, we're trying to extend the presence right now. And I think it's important to have a, a more sustained and a longer term missions on the moon. Um, right now, we're looking at maybe 30 to 60 days for some of those, um, those missions um, after that initial kind of landed mission in 24 of really, which is looking about, you know, seven, seven to 14 days. Um, the, the whole concept here is that interplay of those robotic systems and the humans, right? So um, some of the concepts that at least we're looking at here um, are really pre-placing uh, surface assets prior to landing. Um, so things like the habitat, um, you'll see some pressurized rovers, all of these can get delivered um, and pre-placed robotically, can be teleoperated um, even from, from the human perspective and also have some different automations so that we could really have a good interplay of allowing the humans to do what they need to do um, and be the most efficient. Um, and, but then in allowing um, a greater exploration by uh, limiting that crew time to do some of those other tasks that can really be handled by um, a robotic or a teleoperated system. Um, so there's obviously going to be a need for a lot of cargo elements to, to bring supplies to support the humans. Um, the whole, uh, you know, you'll see some other uh, on this chart, you'll kind of see some uh, antennas on the, on the top left there. Um, deep space communications, really critical technology um, that's needed. I'll touch base on some of that in a moment, um, as well as, you know, um, really from a, a human perspective, um, you know, again, those, those robotic precursor missions to really help identify the humans and uh, that where we actually would want to uh, have those human experiment, those human missions, um, and and really, you know, bringing, uh, you know, s surface systems like this can really bring that science and those experiments to the surface. So, um, the more kind of down mass we have, um, the more we can uh, really learn about uh, the surface and the moon. And really, I see it as really truly a robotic and human uh, interactions. Right? It's it's an interplay of robotic and human um, in order to really uh, learn, um, you know, handle and, and answer some of those critical science questions um, and, and, you know, really have a sustained presence um, on the moon and, and really what the moon village is all about, right, is, is coming together and, and making sure that we can um, really be um, there on the moon and, and not just flags and footprints, but really, um, you know, have a good presence. I want to talk a little bit about, um, so you've heard me talk a little bit about landers. Um, so there is a, a lot of opportunity and a lot of um, a, a science and, and not only scientific exploration, um, but also even, you know, pre-placing some of the things that the humans need um, for some of these different robotic landers. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit, Lockheed Martin does have um, a, a design and, and a capability for a, a smaller um, uh, lunar lander. So our kind of standard capability right now, about 350 kilograms deliverable, but we can evolve that and, and meet whatever kind of, the, whatever the need of the customer and, and the payload is. Um, 
but we do have, you know, pretty cool um, design here. We've got a real great history of some flight proven avionics. Um, we have a pretty large payload deck um, that really is adaptable so we can deliver a, a, a number of different payloads, whatever the need is. Um, you know, some high ground clearance for the rugged terrain um, and really building on that, um, you know, that the Lockheed Martin systems really building on those heritage, right? Um, that kind of swish chart at the beginning, we've been involved in um, a lot of really, really interesting, uh, really challenging scientific missions. Um, and so really building on that um, and, you know, trying to ensure that we can keep doing that and, and really uh, enable some of the exploration of the moon. Um, lunar communications and navigation. So um, we're also really working on, uh, from a Lockheed Martin perspective, and, and I think everybody can agree that having, um, you know, high data rate communications, um, navigation, uh, on-orbit processing, um, all of that um, really is going to enable um, this, you know, wider variety of users. Um, you know, we do have deep space network and there are other commercial providers um, that, you know, are actually looking at providing uh, those communications as a service. Um, but, you know, we're also looking at that, um, you know, from a Lockheed Martin perspective, we are we're building out a mesh network. Um, so basically that right now, if you're looking at services from a communications relay, navigation, on-orbit processing, um, we're looking at building up capabilities um, and, really looking at some of those key technologies in our solution, looking at mesh networking and resource sharing, um, delay tolerant networking protocol. Um, it really allows disruptions to the network. Um, like, you know, especially if a particular node can't see the earth at all times, um, that's one of the challenges uh, at times on uh, some communication, not only from the lunar surface, but also obviously across, <clears throat> across the, the solar system is, you know, having that line of sight communication. So we're working on that, um, you know, it, getting around that capability using this, this DTN protocol um, and, and really navigation. So uh, location information, tracking, routing, um, and collision avoidance um, information as well. And, you know, not only <clears throat> collision avoidance with the moon, but hey, I'd, I wouldn't mind. It'd be kind of interesting if we have to also, and we would at some point, have to be able to avoid other assets on the surface, right? Um, so if we've got a lot of um, a real true moon village, um, <clears throat> you know, being able to actually navigate around um, other other elements. Um, nuclear power and, and um, Scott, I don't know if you want to talk this one, you're welcome to, um, or I'll just talk it and Scott's available for all the cool questions after. Um, <laughs> but really, uh, you know, from a nuclear power propulsion technologies, um, NTP, nuclear thermal propulsion, pretty critical technology, I think. Um, and not only for lunar exploration, but you know, actually exploring uh, the rest of the solar system uh, really has a much greater propellant efficiency compared with chemical rockets. Um, you know, we can enable some faster, more robust systems um, in the abort scenarios um, that are really not possible with a chemical propulsion system. Um, and then really, I think nuclear surface power is something that um, you're I mean, both of these nuclear technologies, uh, it's not only NASA that's interested in them. Um, I know DARPA from the United States perspective also is, is looking into these capabilities, um, but really, you know, getting that high power <clears throat> lunar surface operations, um, that's really how you're gonna get the, that resource extraction. That's how um, you're going to enable um, the most efficient you know, ISRU and, and processing of, of uh, those surface um, capabilities. Um, and really just getting that, uh, those megawatts of that reliable, um, self-sufficient power um, that is not dependent on, on solar or, or some other solutions. Um, so I think that's pretty critical technology that, um, that could enable a real good, true sustained presence. And uh, so that's, that's really, I just want to kind of leave you with just kind of a cool um, uh, artist rendering of you know, a potential, um, you know, colony on, on the moon, um, a real, a base set up there. Um, and just, you know, imagine yourself basically on the, on the moon, um, getting to look out at the stars across the mare and, uh, and looking at your, your home for the next, you know, six months to a year there on the surface.
Um, so I will um, leave you with that picture and uh, let uh, Scott and I know if you have any questions. Uh, thanks, Kat, for the great talk. And I can keep an eye on the questions here. If anyone mm -hmm. wants to write them in the Q&A box. While we do that, uh, maybe one question for both of you right now, uh, which is something that our participants are also trying to answer, is what do you think are maybe the top two or three technologies that are going to either they're already kind of changing the way we look at lunar exploration or there would be in the in the coming next five or 10 years? I'll throw that at Scott first. I've done a lot of talking. <laughs> sure. So uh, technologies, bus, <laughs> right? There's no, there's, so there's two of them really that uh, Kat has kind of touched on that really will enable sustained lunar presence. And, we'll, and those two technologies are ISRU, which is a whole lot of technologies actually together that'll enable in situ resource utilization. How do we turn that regolith on the moon there into uh, rocket fuel, uh, water to drink, air to breathe, you know, um, the basic human necessities that will uh, enable us for a, a long-term stay instead of just a few days, you know, as we've done in the past. And the other one is um, the nuclear power that Kat talked about. The nuclear power on the moon is, is you know, lunar night's a very real thing, obviously, and, and having to survive those temperatures and uh, for that long of a duration really eliminates any kind of solar power you can use. So what do you have left? What can you bring with you that'll generate reliably large amounts of power for a very long time? Um, NASA is aware of this, NASA is involved in it. They sent out multiple solicitations and um, they're working on that next generation nuclear reactor that we can use on the moon to power all of these rovers, the habitats, all the environmental systems that go along with them. And um, those two technologies together, I think are really, game changing in the sense that they enable um, sustained presence as no has been possible at this point. Yeah, I concur with everything Scott just said. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. <laughs> Reese uh, actually is asking, uh, this, this connects really well to what you were just talking about. What's holding back NTP from becoming a more regular reality? Okay, so NTP from regular reality. Um, there's two things really. Um, regulatory environment is one of them. And when I say regulatory environment, I mean, uh, there's a lot of misinformation on nuclear power in the sense that people think that if you launch one and something happens with the rocket, it's gonna turn into a nuclear bomb, right? And then it's gonna have massive implications. And really um, all of the nuclear programs now are being looked at for um, a very low enriched uranium fuel. So the, um, the technology itself, the fuel pellets that are being used and the, and the, the development that is happening is still, um, Moving forward, if you look at the, the nuclear power programs that were done for propulsion back in the 60s, we had a NERVA and Rover program. Both of those programs used a highly enriched uranium. And um, that development was kind of stopped along with the rest of the space program. Uh, as far as deep space and lunar exploration was concerned, they didn't really see it, much of a need for it then. However, now that we're talking about moving humans to Mars, sustained um, cislunar mobility, you really have to have the efficiency of a nuclear thermal propulsion engine. So when we talk about um, what's holding it back, there's number one, the regulatory environment. I think number two is the fuels. Um, getting the public on board with being able to launch um, a nuclear fueled rocket is something I think that we haven't really um, seen before. And it'll be a learning process and it's gonna take some time to make it happen. But I think that's really what's holding it back. The technology is there. We have the capability to do it. Um, it'll be exciting to see how it comes forward. I know for a, uh, for a couple of years, actually, we were having this discussion at the uh, UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space about like kind of mm -hmm. how the, the use of nuclear power sources in space would look like. Um, it, it is, are there any international um, schemes that would affect the way the technology would be used in the future for lunar exploration? 
international scheme. So I'm not sure I understand then, the question. Are you thinking like, you mean from a fuel perspective and, and sourcing the different fuels or do you mean from like a collaborative effort? Um, I think both from uh, limitations and what type of fuel or uh, in general, what type of technology you can use. Um, mm -hmm. And also like in terms of collaboration, I see in our questions, we have a couple of people asking like, are there opportunities to collaborate on, on these efforts or are there limitations, for example, from agreements relating to the moon that are already in place that would prevent uh, people from using um, nuclear power sources, for example, for safety? Sure. So um, really the, the low enriched uranium that we're talking about using goes into fuel pellet called HALU, which is high SA, low enriched uranium. And it's very, very low percentages. So you don't get into a lot of the concerns with weapons grade radiative materials. So you really have to deal with um, the, the stuff in, in powder form really is, is quite safe. You know, there's, um, uh, you know, but it's just Edian or anything, but it's something that is uh, um, not naturally, uh, it requires a whole lot of different technologies than the original reactors did back in um, the 60s and early 70s with highly enriched uranium. You need a moderator block. There's a lot of technology to go into there that help essentially boost up that uranium's ability to create um, the heat necessary for those high thrust scenarios you're looking at. So um, from a fuel perspective in an international environment, I don't necessarily think that there's a, really any agreements that would prohibit that use. And that's really why we've looked at using that fuel is it's rel you know, when you're talking about a nuclear scenario, it's relatively a safe fuel. And as such, um, I'm not aware of any um, like ITAR requirements or anything for that fuel that would prevent anybody really from using it. Um, we have another question uh, more about astronomy. Moon is a great place for astronomy and it will be a great asset to set up telescopes there. But considering the fact that telescopes are very sensitive to dust and regolith, uh, how do you think uh, telescopes could be set up on the moon and what type of technologies would be needed to kind of mitigate the effect of dust there? Yeah, um, I guess I'll, I'll try and, and jump on that one. And then Scott, if you have anything to add that I missed. Um, so yeah, I mean, the moon is, is a great uh, place for astronomy, um, you know, and, you know, as far as setting up telescopes on the surface, I mean, the, the primary thing is, is probably gonna be dust. It's two things, right? Is getting it to the surface without damaging any of the, the optics um, and without kicking up enough dust um, there where you're you know, gonna actually have problems, um, but also ensuring that there's a zone around there where you know, you're not also either landing other spacecraft um, because you know, the whole landing process, you know, when you're using you know, rocket landing, like how we've typically done things, it kicks up dust particles for kilometers um, and it, it can really rain down a, a pretty good dust stream. Um, so there are, there are, so, uh, there is a lot of dust mitigation, um, work going on, um, to, you know, figure out different ways to keep surfaces dust free. Um, I've seen a lot, um, I know NASA has been doing a lot with different, you know, charges and charging up, uh, particles and trying to actually eject particles off surfaces, different methods of cleaning. Um, but I think it's, it's a tricky topic because you could get it there. Um, I mean, there's no, you know, atmosphere on the moon, it's not going to blow things around, but if we have rovers and other things, you can still get different particles landing on there um, and causing problems. Um, I'm not certain of anything particular that I've seen in research where someone's looking at, you know, that a particular telescope set up on the moon and dealing with that. Um, but I don't know, Scott, if you've seen any more on that recently. Um, recently, no. I have seen concepts of taking one of the larger craters, essentially tarping it, mm -hmm. like using the natural features of the moon, like um, like Arecibo was, right, where you yeah. stretch an entire large um, array across an area um, on, particularly the dark side of the moon, dark side, um, mm -hmm. where you have a very electromagnetically relative quiet zone. Uh, I think is it would be the most advantageous area, and then. Like to your point, like you'd said, there's there's a number of scenarios where you need to consider um, plume situations of that regolith flying around. So it would naturally be somewhere you would not want to land and have your telescope. So it would be considered, you know, a robotic 
type mission where we would have um, much like how we control Hubble nowadays, right? We could control from Earth, it would be on the dark, on the far side of the moon and we'd be able to um, um, do all the science from Earth and not have to have people with the telescope there, which I think keeping to people, equipment, you know, rocks and everything away from it is really gonna be essential in managing that dust that has no other way to transport. <laughs> Well, shifting from dust to and other resources on the moon, I guess uh, you all talk, uh, in in the talk you talked about uh, in situ resource utilization, and uh, the question we have is uh, ISRU plants will definitely be key to a sustainable base. Other than the immediate necessities, how are we looking at extracting more common metals for more day-to-day -day manufacturing and constructing? Is biomining going to be a key technology or will more traditional smelting be used? Hmm. That's a great question. So Kat, do you want to talk a little bit about that or do we want to talk about, so, so there, yeah. part of ISRU is, you know, um, one of the charts that Kat had showed earlier showed the uh, deposition of different elements across the lunar surface. Um, extracting the water from that regolith and, and that rock substances will yield um, all sorts of byproducts, right? Um, in, in understanding what happens in an ISRU situation, all of those byproducts become captured elements that we can use for other things, right? Otherwise, you're not just gonna waste, it. you're putting so much energy into those into those substrates that you're gonna have, um, it would not make sense to just discard those things, right? So then you, you change from just mining operations into, you know, does smelting make sense? Is that the easiest thing we can do? It requires lots of power to smelt um, different metals. So um, again, that points towards a nuclear kind of scenario, but something to think about is that those byproducts are, um, the building blocks of what we would expect to use for a lot of the in situ building scenarios. So not only would we like to build um, uh, habitats and things on the moon, but some of that science and stuff will require all sorts of raw materials that um, the less we can bring from earth, the better, I'll put it that way. <laughs> um, the more things that we can create on the surface and, and utilization of those byproducts is definitely a part of that scenario that makes the most possible sense. Uh, Kat, do you want to add anything to that? Um, no, I think I think Scott covered that one pretty well. Um, one of the things in this workshop that we're uh, one of, I guess, our working groups is looking at is the role of emerging space countries. Um, and the question that Ho has is how can we ensure emerging space countries can contribute to the development of technologies for the moon village? I guess one of the uh -oh. things that is interesting mm -hmm. from the workshop perspective is also whether there are areas of technology that that uh, the emerging space nations can play a role in in developing. Sure. So, um, I mean, and, and I think Jorge, you're in. Um, I think we we talked about this at one point, but I'll, I'll throw something on there, and then Scott, if you want to add some other thoughts. Um, so, I mean, yeah, there's definitely a place for emerging space countries. Um, to contribute. Um, I think, you know, really the, the whole, I mean, the grand idea of the, the moon village is, you know, it's, it's not just the handful of the, of the strong, you know, the more dominant space countries. I think there's definitely a place for, for the whole world there. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of, of good technologies uh, that exist in some of those emerging nations, especially when I think about um, different tools for, for mining, resource extraction, um, you know, those, those terrestrial technologies that are very applicable. Um, also, you know, from an instrumentation uh, perspective, uh, I know there are a lot of uh, good uh, emerging nations that have universities or, or uh, government research areas and laboratories um, that are working on some, some key um, optical technologies on uh, different sensors uh, that could definitely be very useful uh, hosted payloads. Um, for, for various missions. Um, there are also initiatives, um, I know of one in particular, just because of, uh, you know, being at Lockheed Martin, um, is one called uh, Milo, 
um, and it is actually at the Arizona State University. Um, Lockheed Martin is part of this basically collaborative uh, initiative to uh, really, um, you know, get those those principal investigators and and those technologies uh, out into space and hosted in space. And I know Milo is working across the world, um, talking with uh, several emerging nations. Uh, to try and figure out how to fly and host um, different technologies, uh, really with the, the purpose of getting to the moon and, um, uh, and that exploration. I know um, some of them are, are looking at from Eclipse, the commercial lunar payload uh, services perspective. Um, and, um, and so I think there's definitely some capability there. Um, of course, you know, there could be certain ITAR issues if you're trying to work with the United States, but I know in general from a, a payload hosting uh, perspective, I mean, we work with with nations all, all over the world. Um, so that's, I think that's the little piece that I have some knowledge about and some thoughts on. Scott, uh, I don't know about if you've got anything else to add. I don't, I think you did a great job on that one. The next question is from Alexandra and uh, she's asking <laughs> if either of you had unlimited budget, what technology concept would you want to build first for the future lunar exploration? <laughs> Boy, um, that's a big one. I think that's I know what. Right? I know that's a good one. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Alex is a is at LM here in Denver. Um, so, uh, oh gosh, um, I want it all. Uh, I mean, honestly, if I think of of one of the the biggest challenges, I think is is power, right? If we had, I mean, I guess unlimited. And unlimited power, um, but really, if we could just get, um, you know, a huge surface power plant, nuclear or, or whatever, right, that um, could be established, um, you know, or hey, power beaming from orbit, right, so you could hit other areas of, of the surface. I don't know. Um, I feel like power is critical. Everything that we talk about when we're looking at these systems, the first thing we do is, well, there's two things we do. One is figure out what the mass of the system is so we can actually get it there. The second is what's the power because you're not gonna be able to do much um, if you can't generate enough power to run your systems and especially in the survive the lunar night situation. Um, so um, I think, yeah, definitely power. Um, if, if it wasn't from a, a power perspective, I would say, um, you know, a really huge habitat where you know, we could have basically a little lunar dome colony, whatever it may be. Um, that would be the other thing. But uh, again, you would need power to run it. <laughs> Go ahead, Scott. <laughs> no, I think that's that's a, that's a great idea, Kent. And I, if I were to choose right now with unlimited budget, I would say start building the Mars Transit Vehicle. Start building oh, yeah. the ideas and and the international collaboration necessary to create the. The starships you saw in space in, in 2001, a space odyssey, right? The large ones that you can't launch from the surface. So there's things like um, in space manufacturing and assembly that needs to happen. There's all sorts of technology that need to be um, brought forward to enable a sustained human presence. And I say human presence because I really think that this is a human endeavor, right, Kat? This isn't just um, an American centric yeah. type thing that. Um, I think once we can develop a vehicle that will take us to a whole nother planet, you know, getting to Mars, having the technology you talked about with the nuclear reactors um, on the surface to provide all the power that we need. Um, I feel like that's going to be an international effort. If you look at all the larger rocket programs now, um, take SLS, for example, there's modules on that from the ESA. There's, um, there, there's, I think something like 17 different countries that are putting parts on that rocket. So it really, I think, is more of a human exploration thing than it is a NASA or Lockheed Martin thing. I think we all need to work together to be able to, to achieve a kind of um, uh, sustained presence anywhere past the moon. So all the technologies I would pick would be good for the moon, but then they would continue to be used on um, mm -hmm. further deeper space explorations. I've got another cool, crazy one too. Space elevator on the moon. Yeah. It would handle yeah. a lot of <laughs> your problems with kicking up yep. dust and landing things and then leaving all these, all this stuff on the surface, right? Space elevator. I mean, it's 
theoretically possible. It's just would take billions and billions and billions and billions of research and, you know, <laughs> some specialized materials and maybe an asteroid on the end as the counterweight. But I mean, there's, there's definitely, that'd be kind of fun. Unlimited funds are a good thing. Yeah. Unfortunately, they don't exist. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Saba has um, an interesting question as well. Uh, when we talk about sustainable lunar operations and technologies, we typically focus on the definition of sustainability, meaning long term or living off the resources we can obtain there. However, what are your thoughts on actual lunar sustainability? How do you develop our technologies and strategies? while keeping the protection of the lunar environment in mind, also bearing in mind that the moon plays a huge role in our ecosystem here on Earth as well. And I'll also add one thing to the end of that. Uh, the moon plays an important role in, in several cultures, especially in North America as well. And uh, a, a big challenge for those cultures and engaging with in, in general space exploration or the moon exploration has been this, that they are concerned about the effect that they, these activities would have on the moon. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's a, a really, really great question and, and something that I think a lot of people don't, <clears throat> don't really think about, right? Um, you know, this, this is a whole nother planetary body um, and we do need to ensure that our activities are not, um, you know, polluting, disturbing it, you're doing that as, as minimally as possible. Um, and right now, a lot of the, the initial technology and strategy and thought is, hey, there's a great resource here. Let's, let's use what we have. Um, and so I think there are from a, you know, there, there's, if you want a real true, you know, in situ, you've got to, I mean, the whole point behind that is, you know, trying to be as self-sustaining as possible. Um, and using what you've got where, where you are. Um, but there's also where from the lunar perspective where we are not very far from earth. Um, if we can get, uh, you know, the, the launch cost down, you could use more earth assets and bring more things from earth, um, which then kind of creates a, you know, you want to make sure you're not actually creating more space junk and garbage. Um, so that just kind of creates another problem. Um, I think looking at things like, I mean, I can take one particular technology, um, you know, as much closed loop, as many closed loop systems as you can. Um, so I'll just take one from an environmental perspective, environmental controls, life support. Um, you know, that's one way we can do this by having those closed loop systems, regenerative um, environmental controls um, is, is one area. Then you wouldn't be, um, you know, having to use as much uh, water um, out of that, uh, maybe that ISRU plant. Um, <clears throat> The, um, the other thing is, I, I mean, I do think, you know, from a power perspective, nuclear um, could help along those lines. Um, but, um, but yeah, I actually, I'm, I'm going to have to think a little more about this one because I don't know, Scott, when, when y'all are talking with, um, you know, the whole surface infrastructure, does this, does this come up a lot in terms of trying to really preserve the, the lunar surface? Sure, of course. Um... You know, I think there's also a cultural component into the, in the question a bit. You know, there are a lot of um, cultures and religions that hold the moon in a special place, much like um, a lot of different uh, celestial objects, right? So I think mm-hmm. um, there is a level of assumed, um, I'm going to say, oh, respect, I guess, is the best way I can say, where um, the basis of all exploration programs should always be to tread lightly and leave every place you go to better than how you found it, right? Now, there's debates back and forth on what that really means. Um, but, you know, there's, there's, we, we've seen it on, in scenarios where, like, we try to put up new telescopes in, in Hawaii on Mauna Loa, Mauna Kea, and, and there's very, very, large cultural um, implications to those um, 
to those telescope installations. And so trying to be sensitive to people's cultural requirements and, and their uh, religions when it comes to these type of scenarios, I think is, is something that definitely has to be part of that mission scenario. I think that should be planned for and that should be um, done in the most respectful ways possible. I think, you know, I, I don't think to Kat's point, you know, all the things that we bring from Earth, we shouldn't bring trash and things with us, right? We don't wanna, we don't wanna create, you know, a, a dirty environment for anyone on the moon you know, and, and it doesn't serve anyone's purposes. And that's just realistically wasted resources, right? It doesn't, it's not a very efficient way to do things. And we're always trying to find the most efficient way to reuse everything, have everything be multi-purpose, have everything, have the capability to um, not be a, a single use item, right? So recycling of all those, those materials like we talked about in ISRU and being able to reuse as much as we can on the planet um, while being respectful too, it, in my opinion, you know, the moon holds a very special place. And, and one day, hopefully one of our lifetimes, we'll be able to look up and see lights on the moon, right? From colonies and things that are there you see in the sci-fi movies. I think that'd be a really cool thing of, of knowing that people are living there, but doing it in such a way that, that understands that there's a lot of cultural sensitivity, I think is very important. I hope that answered the whole question. <laughs> oh, it did. Um... I, I guess the last two questions that I'm going to put forward um, are going to be, because a lot of the talk today was about technologies that enable operation on the surface from a general perspective, but we have two discussion groups that are focusing on specific areas of operation. And I thought it's interesting to ask your opinions about technologies that could enable those. Um, so one of the things that we are discussing this week is lunar medical autonomy. and we already had a talk about the details of that, but I, I was thinking if, if there are any technologies that come to your mind that you think are important to focus on to enable that element of improving medical autonomy on the, on the surface of the moon. Yeah, so I think um, the, the one thing is uh, that real high data rate um, uh, communications so having that communication back to earth for, for any situation where you didn't already have a, a specialist on the surface who could um, handle that um, because you could, if you could high data rate um, and, you know, as low of a um, uh, delay in transmission, um, sorry, it's kind of early here in Denver, <laughs> um, delay in transmission uh, um, as, as possible, I think would be real critical with, with good video um, because you could, then have some some good um, discussions with some specialists back on Earth if there really is a, a major emergency. Um, I think the the other thing is you know from a a, ro a robotics perspective and and potentially being able to actually um, you know perform surgeries and procedures um, either tele operated again high data rate would require that um, or um, or at least you know potentially you know looking into the sci fi future uh, completely automated. Um, so, you know, simple stuff. Oh, there's an appendectomy. Okay. Well, this robot's plan, you know, program to do that. Um, I mean, that's kind of in the, in the distant future, but, um, I think that is critical. Um, also in terms of, you know, being able to generate a, a clean enough space, um, and, and really mitigating dust, um, and, and other, uh, impurities and problems that, and bacteria growth and things that kind of just come along in general. Um, but, you know, in the space environment are just um, a lot more tricky to handle and get control of. Um, the, the lunar dust gets everywhere um, and it's very harmful to your lungs um, and your, your body and all your systems in general, your eyes, everything. Um, and I think having very good, clear ways to uh, mitigate the gut dust, treat the symptoms um, of the dust if you do get contamination. Um, and also being able to isolate and, and ensure that you are in a environment that's not, you know, um, that inhibits some of that bacterial microbial growth, uh, because I do think that's also a, a pretty key piece there of, of the human uh, element. Scott, other things? Unless Chris is online, Chris Leinhardt, and <laughs> he can answer some more of that. I think he gave the keynote on this stuff. So, I, I think you pretty much covered it, Kat. There's, yeah. uh, you know, telemedicine via a secure uh, high-speed data network yet to be designed. Um, it's a key element of that. The other portion is too, is, is I would assume that every, um, every mission carries medical professionals, 
right? Now, granted, they're not going to be specialists in every possible medical scenario, but bringing a qualified doctor on every one of those missions to provide that medical support in situ, essentially, um, I think would be an absolute requirement of any mission. If you look at a lot of the astronaut cadre now, um, a number of them are medical professionals, doctors, mostly treatment of um, emergency conditions, but a lot of them are, are general practitioners as well. Uh, and I guess the other side of it is we're also discussing Moon as a base for science. And I'm, I'm curious if there are any technologies that stand out to you in enabling new science um, on the Moon. So, um, so I think um, one of the critical pieces there is survive the lunar night. Uh, we've done a lot of exploration on on the near side of the moon, um, but the the far side um, really um, we haven't had as much um, there and, and as much data. And a lot of that is because you um, <clears throat> you know we don't um, we haven't quite worked out full surviving the lunar night. Um, so I think that's one piece that could enable a lot of really interesting um, uh, technologies. <clears throat> I think also. You know some things uh, from a, a lunar navigation, uh, lunar navigation, and kind of landing technologies. Um, you know, I talked earlier about. Um, so there's there's two things there, kind of that I want to touch on. One is that precision landing capability. So really being able to land exactly where you want to land in that very um, land or you know rove or, or mobility systems that can actually get you where you need to go, right, um, with minimal disruption on the surface. Um, and, um, and so I think it's kind of that piece as well as, you know, figuring out ways to not kick up as much dust um, that would actually impact other sensors and other, other areas on the moon. Um, and, and I think, you know, there's probably a lot of, I'm, I'm not our planetary scientist. If, um, if one of them was here, they could probably answer it a lot better than I. Um, but there are a lot of, of sensors and technologies and um, that, um, you know, we've used on the moon already and used on different missions. Um, but I really think those two pieces are all two that I'll touch on for now. Scott, other thoughts? Um, I'm trying to think of specific moon enabling technologies that, mm -hmm. that would be helpful, right? And what I can, most of what I can come up with is that anything that's low gravity essential, right? So that enables all sorts of new structures for building that enables all sorts of um, low, thr low thrust escape scenarios where you can launch stuff much more easily from the lunar surface than you can from Earth, not just because of the gravity considerations, but because of the atmosphere considerations as well. So there's, um, there's a lot of vacuum dependent things that we can look at on the moon too. Um, I think really anything that is, is vacuum dependent and and low gravity dependent would be where I would go first with any kind of science experiments. Great answers. And with that, thank you both for joining us today uh, and for sharing your thoughts on, on technologies that enable the future Moon Village. Awesome, thanks for having us. This was fun. And everyone have 